Okay. Uh, my name is Brian Zonstecker, and uh, my company is Power Rocks. And uh, due to the, uh, I guess, massive nature of the topic and the limited nature of the time, uh, I, I think I want to uh, give a couple of disclaimers here. Um, first of all, um, <laughs> actually, this kind of reminds me, my, my, my wife and I eloped, and, and we, we, we did our own vows. And without going into detail on that, one, one involved in mine, one of them started with, I had a nightmare the other day. And I won't finish that story, I can talk to you about that offline, but it kind of reminds me of this too. Uh, because this is such a big topic, you probably want to get a, a lot of detail on this, so I can tell you ahead of time, you will be severely disappointed by this presentation. So, now that we got that out of the way. Um, so what we're talking about here, and, and I'm a power guy, just to, to preface this also, I, I come from the server power world. Um, so I am not a long time cellular network person. Actually, this is something I got into in the last year because of my interest in 5G because of the major power implications. So keep in mind as I'm going through this, there will be an emphasis all the time on the power implications. And, and this is also an excerpt uh, for this short talk today. Uh, it was an excerpt from a, you know, essentially a, a, a half day, three hour workshop uh, I put together on this that still is essentially an intro to this topic. So for that reason, a couple things are mostly in the slides, also if you download them later to look over in detail, but a couple things I'm going to glance over pretty quick, um, just kind of make a quick point, but I'm not going to dig into them to uh, try and uh, keep up with it. So keep talking about time, I'm yakking, I'm not even into it. Um, so. Today, uh, like I said, will, will be a very brief introduction of 5G for the most part. If you don't know what things like 5G, SDN, and NFV are, you probably wouldn't be sitting here. So again, I will not be spending much time on that. Um, ditto. Um, and then, of course, the same thing with the, what we'll look at kind of a ge general characteristics of a telco data center today, um, and then try and focus on which aspects will be most impacted, in this speaker's opinion, by the uh, the movement to, to the, well I say the promise of what 5G will be since what it actually will be is still um, a couple years out at least. Um, but, but the takeaway here is it really is changing the landscape and again as I'm biased from a power perspective, um, but um, changing something from a power perspective from both the, the kind of the, what I call the power value chain from power plant to load um, as well as things like all the way down to you know distributed power, onboard power conversion um, has a uh, you know a, a major impact to everything from hardware to software to application and and, and whatnot. Um, so we said there'll be a power emphasis. Hopefully some conclusions and uh, perhaps some time to uh, discuss something. So very quickly, we just need to know why you know uh, in terms of market motivation. I just want to cl clue into a couple little things that are, um, to me, will, will really, you know, signify the major shifts that uh, will be associated with 5G. So, uh, one key thing is just, um, you know, where, where the, the areas of growth, right, are, are typically in the regions that are not the, the densest cities. It's not, it's not all, uh, there's a lot of talk about uh, uh, accounting for densification. Um, but, um, but really the, the major projections for growth right, are in the, the areas where they don't already have existing networks, where living by your phone is, is the only way you're, you're connected to the world. So things like India and Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, these markets are actually the ones projected to have the most growth and benefit the most from something like 5G. And by the way, guys, just so you know, regardless of how the, the summit makes the uh, slides available, um, there's I've, everything here and every image, every, everything is referenced in the back, so uh, you, there, there's nothing you can't get afterwards, so just so you know. Um, so, um, what, what, and again, this is just kind of re-emphasize the, the point and, and the direction that, that it's going in and, and in the regions, right? Uh, that w we already have this type of high-speed penetration and projected um, in, uh, especially in North America and Western Europe. So it's these other regions that are actually ripe for, for the most growth and therefore are going to have the, um, you know, uh, I would say require the most foresight and thought into implementing these, uh, these newer uh, architectures. So 
Where does 5G come from? I um, didn't want to spend too much time on this. In my opinion, it's, it's kind of a perfect storm thing. That, and this is one of those stupid graphic things that you know you spend way more time on than you should. So uh, because of that, I have to gratuitously uh, take advantage of it. So you know, I, I, I saw it as like a perfect storm of things, uh, of, of technologies and opportunities and, and markets. Um, so essentially, you know, you have your, uh, your SDN, your NFV, your you know, software-defined, virtualized everything. Um, certainly in the RF uh, area with, uh, you know, uh, very high bandwidth, centimeter, millimeter wave band stuff, uh, sp specific um, antenna beam forming, uh, you know, uh, slicing, uh, massive MIMO, all these really cool things that we don't really have time to get into and, and especially the RF stuff is a little bit out of the context of this discussion. Um, but. Um, certainly, as everyone knows, you know, there's an ever-growing pressure and demand um, driven by the consumer market for, you know, cheaper, faster data, which, which leads to the, you know, all the way back down to the, the spectral the energy efficiency um, that, you know, it not only has to be technically feasible, but it, it obviously has to be um, financially viable. Um, and then uh, the hotspot density is another really interesting aspect that I think drives a lot of the major paradigm shifts. Um, that will have to uh, that are required to deliver on the promise of 5G. So and uh, and to me, intelligent power management is always the key to everything. So this is a common theme you'll you'll hear me mention a couple times um, that you know just bumping up efficiency in power conversion um, does not yield nearly as much benefit as using your 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 watts in a smarter way and therefore um, you know I, I say enhanced power utilization. So, and of course, there's the cute graphic. Oh, it rains, everything was worth it. Okay, so um, for 5G, again, I'm not gonna spend much time on this. I think everyone's seen all this stuff in one form or another. You know the high level benefits, right? Low latency, high bandwidth, everyone, a billion, trillion devices uh, will, will be connected. Um, and, and of course, everyone has their own definition of this. One thing just, just to be clear on is, you know, especially a lot of the telco operators will tell you they have 5G, what their plan is for it. Uh, just, uh, just to bring a little reality to it, right, and this, as an example, this one is, uh, I think this is Nokia's and, um, you know, they call it four and a half, 4.9G. Um, the main point is, you know, it, the actual standard isn't coming out to the you know 2019 2020 time frame, so that's where there's a lot of things that may be billed as 5G like or what I commonly refer to as the promise of 5G, but actual 5G in terms of the standard isn't going to be there till this time frame. So things like you know even South Korea talking about the 2018 Winter Olympics, Japan ha saying they're going to have it for their 2020 Summer Olympics. Um, you know, as, as you, you all likely know, it, you know, even from just the, the time that the, the standard comes out, then there's time to deploy this in a, in a production manner. So, you know, uh, until that time frame, between now and then, everything is 5G-ish, or that's why you hear things like 4.5 or 4.9. Um, but just, just to be clear, uh, just to, like I said, bring a little reality to the difference between, you know, the marketing term for that and the actual network is, uh, and time frame should be something you're uh, aware of. Um, so, what is 5G? Well, really simply, there it is, right? I think it speaks for itself. Um, <laughs> uh, and there's, there's lots of different graphics like this, but I mean, the, the point is, is there's a, um, a change in the traditional cell network today that has a, uh, you know, a, a core network uh, and, a, and a core telco data center, um, you know, some major uh, backhaul um, and, and, and front hall, which goes to uh, macro cell towers primarily. Um, that service a, a many users in, in a larger area, and and um, as uh, and especially as, as Jeff segued to in in a great way. Thank you, Jeff. Um, it, and uh, and also actually, there's a pretty good talk from uh, from Nokia yesterday that really highlighted the idea of you know we're coming from this global cloud and we're coming down these levels. Like you talk about the fog is coming down a level. I said a talk the other day where they claim to bring you down into the mist. So, uh, you know, whatever, even if you're now taken down into the, the water vapor or whatever, um, <laughs> the point is you keep getting into a lower level granularity that gets you straight to the edge, which eventually basically brings you to this, um, or any other 
device like it. So that, that's why things like, um, you know, uh, and I'll talk about this a little more um, in, in future slides here, um, but things like, uh, you know, it's not just, it's not just something that things like mobile edge computing to, to serve these devices at the edge, at the bandwidths and latency requirements, it's, it's an absolute necessity that, that a lot of this processing is done at the edge and never finds its way uh, onto the core network. And, uh, and for me, that's an incredible opportunity in power utilization optimization. Um, so um, a really fundamental key uh, characteristic of these 5G networks is the idea of these uh, HET nets, right? these heterogeneous networks where now it's not like all these operators have their own infrastructures and, and um, you know, f uh, services, plugins, whatever you want to call them, um, is that now everyone has to play together nice in the sandbox. Um, that, that a user, a, a 5G user that's moving from small tower to small tower or small base station to small base station that only supports a very, you know, especially if it's a high bandwidth um, you know, very high frequency type of stuff, you know, supports a very small, uh, limited range. So they have to, you know, be able to pass them off from one to the other. Uh, and that's why, um, you know, whether it's densification, uh, it, which is represented by this darker color, or even some of the, you know, non-denser areas where they're a little more spread out, a little more remote, the point is there's huge, going to be huge growth in small cells. So a lot of this is shifting. And, and from macro cells to a lot of these smaller cells. And what that means is if the, if the traffic is shifting to it, the, the hall and the connection to the network is shifting to it, and therefore the power is also uh, shifting in that direction. Um, so one theme that comes out of OCP, and you're probably you know, getting to the point of what the hell does this have to do with OCP, Brian? You haven't even mentioned it till now. Um, so certainly a, a theme that, that um, behooves 5G implementations very well is the idea of disaggregation, right? Because that um, enables you to, you know, densify the, the individual constituents of a system and then optimize them, you know, for the, the compute, the memory, uh, something is more for optimized for, you know, core network routing versus um, edge buffering, for instance. Um, and, and of course, the, the other beauty of that is the ability to uh, commoditize the solution and uh, kind of level the playing field, or, or in my, my callous view as a power and hardware guy, say really the idea is to mitigate hardware in, in, into obscurity, really, and, and even software to some degree, everything's open so that uh, the, the, the app, the user experience is, is the real product that people focus on. Um, so mobile edge computing, uh, and I don't want to rehash this too much because you've heard a lot about it, and you'll hear a lot more, um, is, is certainly a, a a, uh, you know, a, a large uh, enabling portion, especially things that, you know, a lot of statistics you see pro uh, talking about projections on, you know, overall internet traffic, whether it's today and, and, the, and the growth path, is centered around streaming. So, you know, doing things like um, having, uh, enabling buffering at the edge of, of commonly things allows for a, you know, a, a, a much simpler, faster, uh, experience for the user, um, but it's more efficient in, in the network itself because, you know, today we spend most of our power actually passing data around as opposed to, say, processing it or storing it, um, whatnot. So um, the more that's done to mitigate uh, the, the movement of data, the much greater overall uh, efficiency uh, from a power perspective that, that you're going to see network-wide, right? Um, just to, just off the top of my head, I mean, today, today uh, a cell network is, you know, something like, I don't know, 60, 70 percent of all the power consumed in an entire network is in the base stations, right? And, and that's mostly driven by the PA power, right? The, the, the RF PA. And that will dominate, you know, anywhere from 70 to 90 percent of the base station's power. So um, a focus on reducing and optimizing that yields the most benefit to the entire network uh, power utilization. And um, like I said, there, there's a lot neater things in the RF area for um, reducing power consumption and, and optimizing that user experience, but it's kind of outside today's scope, so we're not going to really have time to get into that. Talk to me offline more about that. Um, also in the interest of time, let's see, I'm going to really breeze over the, the SDN NFV stuff, because I said, <laughs> I like this graphic, right? This, it's pretty simple. I think it's self-explanatory, right? Um, but, but essentially, 
you know, we, we know what virtualized software defined solutions are, right? We take our, simply, we, we take our hardware, we, we pool it virtually and we slice it up as need be um, to, to optimize for our application. Um, uh, same thing for w w whether we're talking about in the data center, typically uh, more in the SDN context or um, for uh, network functionality, which is the, uh, the NFE portion. Um, ditto. Um, so for 5G, you know, is that nice? Is it a, is it a feature add or is it, an ab is it a necessity? And in my opinion, it's an absolute necessity um, because if you want to, you know, not only handle the, the, uh, the amount of users and the handoff between networks, and then even to go a, a, fur, a step further, like Jeff was talking about things like, uh, you know, network slicing and radio slicing and kind of network as a service, um, it, it can require software control, uh, well, monitoring and control on both a, you know, kind of localized and network level uh, working cohesively to, to deliver that. So, um, again, getting back to the, the heterogeneous network theme of, um, you know, sharing from base station to base station and quickly handing off and still maintaining the, uh, the bandwidth and latency specs um, are, are absolutely going to um, require the need of, uh, of uh, you know, software and virtualized controlled solutions. Um, and particularly, you can see I like this graph because it kind of, you know, it says, okay, now we're opening up lots of doors for um, not just um, getting straight to the, the UE on the edge, um, whether that's, um, you know, line of sight or, 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 or Wi-Fi or, 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 or even back hall and front hall that can be wireless or wired, um, you know, kind of explains that you want to have all your options and be able to be adaptive on the fly to what makes most sense based on the load, the user profile, and everything else. So, getting to the meat of it now, um, the telco data center. You know, what, what really differentiates this from a, a typical data center? Well, certainly, um, you know, DC distribution has been around for, uh, you know, well, as, as long as there's been telco data centers. Uh, actually, on, on, the sh on the show floor, you know, especially with, I mean, there's a uh, talk about, uh, you know, when Google came in last year and brought in the 48-volt the rack concept, and I see things now that, you know, talk about 48 volts like it's the newest greatest thing out, uh, you know, uh, newest revolutionary thing to, to come to data center power. And it makes me chuckle a little because it, it's actually the, the most legacy power distribution I, I think there is in, uh, in the data center world. Um, and, and that's, of course, we don't have time to go into things like uh, HVDC, you know, 380 volt or any number of other uh, higher voltage DC standard implementations and all that. Um, and certainly there can be a level of um, robustness like, like the, the NEB standard that, um, you know, require a higher level of, of ruggedized uh, hardware than, than your typical commodity data center solution. So, um, and, and, uh, and as a power guy, I said my, my real emphasis and, and interest is where are these watts being consumed and how can we um, consume them more intelligently. So um, that's that concept again, intelligent power management, which we'll talk a little more. Um, and really, th this key thing right here, I think, is the, is the key to understanding the whole major difference in, in what I'm calling a paradigm shift uh, of moving to 5G. Because you may say, well, 4G and LTE today does you know, already implement things like SDN and NFV and even some of the, the more advanced uh, RF techniques, uh, like beamforming and whatnot. Um, but but what, what's really going to change is moving from these large macro base stations to uh, requiring so many of these small cells, right? Uh, whether you call it macro cell, nano cell, I, I even, in my research, I even saw some stuff about an atto cell, <laughs> um, right? And, and so, so the point is, is that each of these small cells now essentially needs to be its own telco data center. Right, so even a, a, a small, you know, down to the smallest, you know, a, a, a basically a base station that, that serves, you know, may only serve a, a, a 10 meter diameter, um, but, uh, and can provide high, high speed data and has a nice beam forming array and whatnot, um, still has to keep all that, uh, keeping with the, uh, the spirit of mobile edge computing, um, is going to have to, um, you know, try and keep as much of that as the edge as possible. And there's kind of a simple example we'll give in a second. Um, but that, that's what's really going to drive a paradigm shift in power as well. 
because you know you have a network today where you have a, a lot of core networking. You have these macro uh, base stations that you know may be on the order of uh, you know one to two kilowatts, um, and now you're shifting that to a you know a heterogeneous network of many small cells that may be down to you know tens of watts or even less. Um, and so the question, you know, the, the simple question I would get on this is, well, what's more efficient, right? And say it's not that, it's not really that easy to say because there's a whole lot of knobs involved here. And, you know, if I said in an area where there's two macro cells serving, you know, a, a few hundred people um, versus uh, 50, you know, femto cells uh, serving the same amount of people, you know, which is more power efficient? Um, you know, small cells, I have the ability to, to turn them on and off more dynamically, um, which is ultimately the, the most efficient thing, as I like to say, is something that's off. Um, but, um, and there's, you know, you mitigate some of the hull, uh, which, which consumes a lot of power, as we discussed before. So it's a multifaceted issue. It, it's more difficult to, to assess, um, even if there's incremental improvements in, in just the hardware itself uh, along the way. So, um, and again, the it, uh, telco data center, I'm, I'm not going to belabor you with, you know, the basics of what make up uh, the data center here. Um, you know, I mean, you know, the, the, the main constituents that uh, on the internal side, the WAN, the, the, you know, the, the, the long haul connection, and then the um, kind of the edge uh, data center. Um, and these lines are graying. But, um, so where 5G comes in, and I'm running out of time here, um, like I said, uh, 4G LTE has already brought a lot of these characteristics, um, but now to really kind of go all in on these small cells um, is, is where it becomes most interesting in terms of the, the opportunity for improvement and, and optimization. So, you know, I'm even waiting for something like, um, you know, small cell virtualization where, where essentially, you know, you take a group of these small cells or base stations and, and virtualize that as a, you know, a, um, I guess it's analogous to what you might call it a VRAN today. Um, and you'll have to excuse my ignorance in this area. Like I said, cell network architectures are not my area of expertise. But uh, the takeaway message is everything gets, you know, more virtualized and, and cut up at, at the, uh, <laughs> that, that, that's the going theme. Um, and so, uh, let's see, we talked a little about mobile edge computing shifting utilization and buffering at the edge. So, how does this play into power? Um, th this is the, certainly the mobile edge uh, computing as the, the absolute largest opportunity to save power. Um, for base station caching, uh, you know, you, n when these things are smaller too, you can have them more specialized for specific tasks. So, whether something's for video buffering, um, or if it's just um, for, you know, buffering of control for the local heterogeneous network or optimization of routing. Um, and uh, and I, I kind of think from a power perspective, it's kind of a, a brilliant strategy of tricking the customer into paying the power bill. You know, anyone who runs a, or is involved in a data center knows that, uh, especially the more, um, you know, hyperscale and commoditized it is, that the, the uh, power bill Right, certainly typically dominates the OPEX, and, um, and to, to a lot of degrees with, with commodity hardware, that actually dominates the total TCO, right, even dwarfing the initial cost of the hardware itself. So, you know, imagine that with mobile edge computing, sounds great, delivers on the, the specs, the promise of 5G, the user is happy, but do they realize now that with, with all the processing and everything that's done at the edge, really, all that compute and stuff that used to be done in that core data center is now being done in their phones. So who's paying for the watts to, uh, to run the, the processing and the, and the memory and the transport of all that? Well, so in a way, you've kind of tricked the consumer into footing some of the power bill that never has to make its way to your data center. So eh, interesting perspective. Um, and, and I like to kind of, I think, sum it all up with the, the case study, what I call is grandma OK. Um, and this is more of a thought experiment and what it means to be, you know, power efficient. Um, now, you, you know, you, you, you have a grandma, she's in her house, you're, you're not there, she still lives on her own, you wonder how she's doing. You've taken advantage of everything 
that, uh, you know, the, the IoT devices and wearables and trackers and everything gives you, and she's all wired up, her house is wired up, and you can track all of her health metrics, her movements, and everything so that, you know, you can feel confident, is grandma okay when I'm not around? Okay, so that's the fundamental question right now. I wake up this morning, I want to know if grandma's okay. Now, with all these devices and sensors and processing, you know, there's tons of data that can be generated um, and, and, and processed and, and passed to the cloud or whatever. Um, but fundamentally, I just want to know, is she okay? Right? And so, it, it's something much simpler, right? If everything is processed in, in her house by her devices, and, and, and so, somewhere to the, in there, there's a consensus that can just report outwardly to me, the only thing that has to be transmitted is a single bit, right? It can be as simple as that. I mean, I'm oversimplifying. Don't hit me on packet headers and you know things like that. But, but the point is, if all I really want to know if she's okay or not, you know, I, I don't need to pass all that data up and process it and 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 share it and store it forever if it's not fundamental to what I'm trying to accomplish. Um, so another interesting thing about all these moving, migrating to many more smaller cells is that it actually yields a lot of energy independence. It certainly enables the ability to use uh, microgrids um, and, and other uh, sources of power. Um, so you know, if, if you don't require as much power to, to run your network or connect to the larger part of the network, then um, that, that kind of frees your ability uh, on, on the source of power, um, you know, redundancy in solutions for fault tolerance, and by lowering your overall power consumption, you know, you, you also um, reduce things like, uh, like, you know, like storage and hold up and, and other things that lead to redundancy cost and, and power waste. Um, and a separate area of interest of mine that I think marries nicely with this topic is energy harvesting. Once you get these, move to these tiny cells that have, have such low uh, power requirements compared to the, the, uh, the legacy macro towers and whatnot, they actually become candidates for, for other um, energy harvesting solutions that are not just, you know, large scale PV systems and all that. Um, so, speeding up here, let's see, uh, we talked about disaggregation uh, already um, and, and the ability to kind of bring a steady state like um, performance profile to, you know, fairly predictable dynamic loads, which, which when, and when you're not using something, you can put it to sleep. So, um, what I'm getting at is for the first time ever, uh, announcing right now, is the uh, introduction of the OCP uh, telco cell, small cell deployment. Um, and uh, <laughs> it's a time and before I see the, the worried look on some of the uh, com OCP community leads faces. So this is something I just made up. It doesn't exist, so don't, don't get too excited. But, but the point is, is if there's going to be this many cells and we want to keep in the nature of the, the, the OCP spirit to standardize and commoditize something that are, are small and supposed to be completely ubiquitous and everywhere, um, it seems like that would be a pretty interesting uh, specification for you know something that that operated uh, in an OCP piece of you know complete system that I could uh, hold in my hand and deploy. Um, so with that, um, like I said, there's a lot of agreement on, on what 5G should be, but keep clear that it still has not come to fruition, and we don't know what it really is um, for at least uh, a couple more years. The base station is becoming the data center. That's the key takeaway, the major paradigm shift here. Um, which therefore relates to power. So intelligent power management also becomes really key to enabling those 5G networks um, by the ability to um, uh, wisely control these things, turn them off, and, and simply mitigate the movement of data where we don't need it. Um, so I also said uh, virtualized software to find everything is, is integral to this. Um, and. Um, it, as, as I, I keep tying things to power as I'm biased too, uh, I, I implore all of you who are involved in actually architecting these networks to keep that in mind um, from the power perspective so that you're architecting that well proactively ahead of time and not seeing it as a, you know, an issue you have to deal with once you have a deployed solution, which is the common plight of any power engineers they'll tell you. So with that, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate your attention and uh, I don't know if we have any time for questions. One or two, uh, otherwise feel free to come and uh, talk to me and be around all day today. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Sir?
like a proprietary appliance system, firewall, that can be made under the glass, processed, and some other key of data. And I just, this box costs a lot of money, it's flexible, I want to go with the adjustable network function, adjustable firewall, that will run on a stack of x 6 servers. So I need mean, to this server to reach the same throughput that these proprietary box. Mm -hmm. Well, and so, and again, just to be clear, I am not someone who architects these things. All right? I, I, you know, I see it as something that, that is enabling and, and um, required to meet some of the promised specs. So, for instance, you know, the, the handoff of, you know, of, of, a, of an active user, you know, still maintaining their, you know, millisecond or, or so latency um, uh, going between heterogeneous cells and networks. Um, it is required in a, a software-defined virtualized function, as I understand it. I, if, I mean, like I said, you, you architect and tell me, but all, wh where, where my input comes in is seeing that it, if this is the type of architecture and solution that's implemented, I can surely see the opportunity to impact power utilization. Um, like, like, for instance, you know, having a small cell that you can turn on and off in a matter of milliseconds and save that, you know, that, that huge piece of the power pie from, from the PA, uh, which is the, the largest piece of the pie in the whole network, um, versus a, a macro cell tower that you know, may take minutes or hours or essentially is, is not turned off for that reason, um, is, you know, is facilitated by SDN and NFE, and therefore um, leads to an opportunity for major savings and power utilization. Did I answer your question? Eh, eh, okay, we'll talk more later. Anyone else? All right, thank you very much again.